It is Tuesday, and you know what that means. It's time for virtual lunch. Welcome back. We took last week off for um, a kind of that uh, re orientation after Labor Day weekend. So hopefully everybody had a good Labor Day. Um, we, Alan and I actually did something kind of fun. We attended uh, way back earlier in the summer. I know I had mentioned Camp Yampire, which is a uh, online summer camp for adults. So Camp Yampire did a state fair edition for Labor Day. So that was quite fun. In fact, our chili won best in the uh, best in competition for the best chili recipe. So that was cool. But anyway, we are back. It's time for virtual lunch. Um, go ahead and if you're joining us from either Facebook or YouTube, go ahead and just type in the comments. Introduce yourself. Tell us where you're joining in from. I know we have a lot of regulars who join us pretty much every week. Um, and if this is your first time, welcome. We're glad to have you here. So basically what we're going to do, we're going to go through uh, some links and some recommended resources, and then we're going to bring on our special guest for today. But I want to start out talking. Oh, Marco is here from Italy. Oh, hot Italy. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we've been back and forth here in Kansas City. We're hot one day, and then like the other day, we almost turned on the heater. So um, it's just that time of year. All right. So we are going to talk a little bit about nostalgia. And so the first link that Alan, my husband, Alan, is behind the scenes, as always, he's going to share with us, is a nostalgic yet isolated trip down Route 66. And this is from the uh, New York Times. And I know their, their site's kind of weird. Sometimes you can read an article and sometimes you can't. So, but here is the link. It is in Facebook. If you are watching in YouTube, if you just click to expand the description, all the links are hiding in there. So don't cheat and go ahead. <laughs> but anyway, it was kind of interesting because they took a drive down Route 66 and there's lots and lots of pictures and it just, it profiles, you know, the different places along the way. Now, Growing up in the Midwest, I've been on bits and pieces of Route 66, but I've never done like the big, long, extended road trip. So anyway, kind of a fun little virtual excursion. I see, and I'm guessing, I don't know if this is Kevin or Mel, but somebody from Classic Exhibit, Smoky Portland, is here. Um, yeah, we've been thinking about you guys. I know, hopefully it's not too close. I know it's not too far away from you, but hopefully you guys are all staying safe. So you're in our thoughts and prayers. Please know that. Oh, it's Mel. Okay. So anyway, but yeah, it's, yeah, it's craziness. I mean, it just 2020, can it get any weirder? <laughs> it just keeps getting stranger and stranger. But anyway, but talking about nostalgia, you're welcome, Mel. We'll continue to keep you guys in, in mind. So hopefully things start to improve soon. But talking about nostalgia, uh, I came across this great article Alan's going to share here um, on nostalgia marketing. It is a thing. It's it's trending. Um, you know, things like, well, for example, I don't know if Rama is here today, but I just got her newsletter this morning and perfect example in there. One of her promotional product examples was a Rubik's Cube. Nostalgia. Uh, you know, Mr. Rogers, the movie came out earlier this year. It's been, you know, that's been a big thing. Um, how many remakes of movies have we seen come out? You know, different things. So, you know, and I know for me, they said like right now, nostalgia is big because, you know, we're all craving comfort. And so people are turning to nostalgic memories of previous times. Well, for me, my nostalgia comforting comforting thing is I listen to a lot of 80s radio stations. So listening to all those songs that I grew up with um, kind of just transports me back and it doesn't seem like, you know, we're living in such insanity <laughs> or something. But so it, it, that's just a really interesting article. So, um, you know, you might want to take a look at that, see what kind of inspiration that you could glean from there. Also wanted to share some industry resources with you. PCMA has a couple of events coming up. One is tomorrow and it's called Recovery Discovery and it's going to be a live broadcast online. Um, I noticed they're doing Facebook, YouTube and also LinkedIn. So um, Alan's gonna put that up. Oh, here we go. So there is that link. 
And then the other one is they're doing an online, the PCMA Foundation is doing an online auction to raise money to help out people in the industry. And so that one is coming up. I did not write the date down. I think it's the 23rd or 28th. It's later in the month. But if you want to go check that out, they got a lot of interesting things on the silent auction. Although I have to wonder all the travel packages, you know, like going to the Bahamas or whatever. I don't know how well those are going to go on auction right now since nobody knows when they might be able to use them. But anyway, uh, so that's coming up. Also, Together Again Expo is coming up again in October. They are going to be doing in Dallas this time, they're going to do a Together Again Expo. And this one, so this is the, the link to the actual press release where you can learn more about it. But this time they're going to include something a little different. They're going to do a socially distanced concert one night. So that'll be, that'll be interesting to see. I know I've seen some concerts done where they have like the big landing platforms and they have them all set out. So like you, you and your group stay on your little platform. So I don't know if that's how they're going to do it or not. But anyway, so that will be interesting. And then I think, Alan, you also have the link straight to the Together Again page. There we go. So, so there are those links. And then I see we have Rama is here. I don't know if you heard me talking about you, Rama, or if you got on a little late, but I was just giving the example of your Rubik's Cube as a great example of nostalgia marketing. Um, San Diego for a little while, busy day amidst the smoke and haze. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You you guys on the West Coast, it's just, wow, it's brutal. So we feel for you. We keep you in our thoughts and prayers. So, And then Chuck is here from Elite Expo from St. Louis. So he's just the other side of the state from me. And... Oh, yes. Good point, Rama. Uh, together again, yes. Those of us who attended virtually last time felt a little cheated because because all we had to see was what was happening on the stage. So I do hope that they they took our suggestions and they're going to do more virtual event broadcasting from the show floor because the, there wasn't really anything last time. So, yeah, I'm signed up for virtual attending again. So hopefully uh, we'll see what happens. All right. And then uh, let's see one more link that I have. Oh, and one other thing I just wanted to throw out a little, this is kind of a preview teaser of our topic next week. We're going to talk industry surveys and trends, um, but 53, uh, this was actually from the uh, survey that was done by Ufi and SISO. It's 53% of exhibitors expect their trade show spending to return to normal within 12 months, you know, after things pick back up and 28% expect their spending to go back to normal levels immediately as soon as trade shows start opening up again. So that is very encouraging news. So I wanted to share that. But then also there's a, there was a really good interview that Jim Worm from EACA did last week with the GMs from the convention centers in Orlando. Um, and here's the link for that. Orlando, Vegas, and Chicago. So he got all three of the, the general managers there and they were talking about what's going on in their particular city and how things are coming back and how they're preparing their convention centers and all that. So it was a very, very informative interview. So, um, and I realize it's on Facebook. It's probably on the EACA website as well. I haven't checked for it there, but uh, anyway, you can look for that. So that's really good. All right, let's see. I think that is it for links for today. So I want to bring on our guest, our special guest for today. I actually was first introduced to the experience economy 20 years ago. A good friend of mine came to me and she works at a museum and she came to me and she said, I have been reading this great book and I think it would be really relevant for you in the trade show industry. It's called The Experience Economy. Oops. There we go. And so anyway, so she she recommended that I go take a look at it. So I read it and I really I was so impressed. It was like it was so much the the things I was already thinking about, you know, multi-sensory marketing and using themes and and engagement techniques and 
you know, it was like somebody just took all that and put it into such a great um, logical format. And I was so impressed. And so, um, you know, I then when I was working on my book, Build a Better Trade Show Image, I connected with Jim and Joe and got permission, Jim Gilmore and Joe Pine, and got permission to use uh, some quotes from their book in my book. So, and since then, I've recommended the book to, you know, thousands of exhibitors across the country at my exhibitor workshops and webinars. And then I also, when I did my second book, Exhibit Design That Works, I actually included a whole section on multi-sensory marketing. I mean, that's how important I think this is. And so anyway, so today I'm very excited to have Jill Moore here. And so Jim is, he's probably well known to a lot of you. He's been an instructor at Exhibitor Live for many years. He's also a professor at uh, Case Western Reserve University, and he also lectures at the Darden Graduate School of Business at the University of Virginia. In addition to Experience Economy, which also came out last year, the 20th edition of the book, so or the 20th anniversary, I should say, um, he's also the author of Authenticity, What Customers Really Want, again with Joe Pine. And his latest book, uh, which I haven't seen this one yet, is Look, a practical guide for improving your observational skills. So welcome to the virtual lunch today. All right. Thank you for having me. And thank you for uh, being such a proponent of experiences. And I'm always honored and flattered when people are able to use the book and promote the book. And you, like everybody else tuning in here, I like what I often like to say is that you all do what I merely write about. So, uh, you know, you're the folks on the ground that, that actually make this stuff happen. So I appreciate, and I appreciate the industry very much. It's in business to business, uh, trade shows are the core experience, long established, vitally mm -hmm. important, and uh, they're needed. So anyway, glad to, glad to be with you. Well, thanks, Jim. It's so good to have you here. And um, I know, you know, you've got a wealth of ideas and I, Right now, we're in such a weird position because, you know, we're trying to be experiential, but it's much more challenging. And, you know, and then moving forward, we're even going to still have some challenges. So do you think has customer behavior forever changed or is this something that we're going to just ride it out and then it'll be more like what we're yeah. used to? Well, <laughs> or that's, that's, I know that's the $64 million question. Exactly. For those of you who remember the, the, uh, the, the, the rigged the rigged game show uh, at least I heard that from my father growing up so um you know I, I don't feign to to have any inside scoop on what's going to emerge from this I as obviously like everybody been thinking about you know what are the implications of all this you know first you know thinking about all the folks who have been immediately affected lost their jobs and so forth um I, I will offer this that uh, I, I like to call this the Corona crisis. I think it is indeed a, mm. a crisis. That's the term my co-author Joe Pine and I have uh, decided to coin. Or not, we didn't coin, but but use. It's it's out there. And you know, I, the way I've been thinking about this is, you know, what's next? I don't. You know, is it going to be back to normal? A new normal? Things will never be the same. This changes everything. That might vary by industry. That might vary by company. Um, and, and I think what I'm encouraging is as difficult as it might be is don't just think about what's next, but what's next, next. Uh, mm. Don't just think post Corona crisis, but post post Corona crisis. And, and uh, let me frame it also this way. I'm, you know, I, I do teach at Case West. So I just got done from two morning management classes with my undergraduates. I'm talking about paradigms, interestingly enough. Mm. And uh, you know, it, it's, it's, Peter and Peter Drucker influences how I structure that course greatly. And Peter Drucker is fond of saying that all innovation um, comes from recognizing discontinuities. There's some change afoot in technology and process technology and demographics and attitudes. Um, and cl clearly, your question is one of will we have any changed behavior and, and, and attitudes? And I like to say that what we're going through right now is not a discontinuity. It's actually a, one giant disruption from which a multiplicity of discontinuities may may emerge. So to me, it's like my book on uh, on look. It's to be watchful, to be be looking for 
first of all, identify all the different sets of behaviors that are happening, not just in this industry, but but throughout culture, and then ascertaining, determining how, how much that's going to be sustained and endured. How much will people like say like too much of that and go back? Will we, we see hybrid models? And I think it's too hard to tell. And I think individual behavior, um, we're all participants in this. Uh, uh -huh. I, will, I will say this, the two points I will make. The experience economy has been most adversely affected by this. Travel is the most important, uh, travel and tourism is the most important part of the experience economy, which is the most important part of the economy. Clearly hotels, airlines, conventions, uh, meetings have been, been decimated um, by all this. And to me, it's proof of what we talked about. We said, look, exactly. we, said a, we said a prosperous economy is necessary to have a prosperous economy. And until those sectors come back, uh, we, we, we will not uh, uh, see a robust economy again. And as we uh, pursue bringing back more experiences, the bar will be raised. Uh, mm. the, 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 the newly released hard copy that you, you held up, the white cover, has a, has a brand new preface that Joe and I worked real hard. There's some real, really good new thinking in there, I do believe. And one of the things we said in the new preface is that every business has the same number one competitor, and, and, that, and that's the smartphone. Mm. And now I will, I will add to that that there's a second competitor. Perhaps it's the kissing cousin of the... Uh, the smartphone, and that's staying at home. So it, the the bar will be raised, and that's stay at home physically or stay at home at your company. The, mm -hmm. the bar the bar will be raised in terms of what it will take for people to deem it uh, worthwhile to go uh, elsewhere versus staying put. So we we now have two large forces at play. You know, with the smartphone, if you're not engaging people in the moment with a tap of the screen or the swipe of the screen, you could be gone elsewhere. Right. right. That's why it's a competitor. And now if if what you say about if your 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 experiences to attract and entice people uh, are not compelling, they may not go. And I think that we may have to shift our focus to a lot of the pre, you know, it's a whole separate experience to talk about attracting and attract and 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 uh, enticing that we may have exactly taken, that we may have taken for granted. Right. People go every year, they go over here and we may have to not just design yeah. for during the event, but have to be a lot more aggressive, frankly, and, and thinking robustly about about all that up front. My friends at Merit's Travel take the attracting phase of experience and they they divide it to announcing uh, um, uh, and, and then after you register, anticipating, mm. you know, they, they break it down to multiple stages because they, re they realize that front end is vitally important in normal times. And now it's right. Expected, so. Well, and a good example of that, actually, I'm signed up for a conference on Thursday this week. And just yesterday, I got my event kit ah, delivered. Physical. And so, physical. yeah, physical, physical event kit was delivered and, you know, you know, good size box. And so I opened the box. It's all wrapped in black tissue with a note on top that says no peeking. We're going to open this together as part yeah. of the experience on Very Thursday. So, good. you know, so I, I'm being a good girl and I didn't open it, but it's like, it's actually, it's heightened that anticipation. I'm like, how long is it now until we can open this? Right. <laughs> but exa exa exactly. And that, and those things cannot be given. It's it's best if it's tied back into later in the event. Mm -hmm. right? it, it, by the way, it's the same with the giveaways we have in the trade show, all the chotskis and souvenirs. I mean, we write in the book about mix-in memorabilia. It's better to actually use a physical thing during the experience and attach your memory to it. So whatever they yes. melt you, it's best if it's used during the event. I, I was a surprise guest at a friend who was doing a keynote at a at a at a conference. It was college admissions conference. I said, Jeff, I'll help you out. You're, you're going to zoom the thing. I said, I'll be a, you know, when you talk about the experience economy, let me be a surprise guest. So I, so I came in and what they told me is it was like, they, they made their conference virtual and it was, in, it was going to be in Chicago. They mailed everybody a tin of a huge tin of Garrett's popcorn and said, make sure you're eating the popcorn. Oh, you know, clever. Right. So I, I'm sure some people kept the tin because this is the, the tin I ate from when I was at the, you know, and so you, you definitely the physical, we need to augment the virtual with the physical, but you can't, but doing it's not enough. You have to think very uh, intelligently about how you can take the things you mail and integrate them uh, into the event, the event itself. Probably always been the case, but again, now it's especially true.
Well, and it'll be interesting to see how they implement all of these, you know, and, and augment all of the items in the kit. And it, and on one side, it kind of, um, you know, puts a little more pressure. It's like, you know, after all this anticipation, if what's in the kit isn't right. that impressive, then right. it kind of defeats the whole purpose. But if it's done right. very well, I've got another one coming up, another conference coming up later in the month that's also doing a kit and they have really hyped the kit. I mean, it's like, yeah. you know, because it's an optional thing or no, I guess it was wasn't an optional thing. It was like you couldn't you couldn't do the conference without buying the kit as well. And so um, it you know it's like wow, this must be really impressive because <laughs> it's like well, yeah, forty nine dollars no. just for the kit. So yeah, I mean there's a lot, a lot there's a lot there to to, to work with. I, I the the physical augmenting the virtual uh, is is necessary and I think uh, is a challenge. You got you got you got like all of this. Yeah. You have to do it, you have to do it well. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, so what other examples have you seen then, uh, you know, since we are in the uh, kind of the experience economy is a little bit in limbo because we we right. miss the the the, the full multi, multi-sensory experience with the taste and smell and touch. Right. But by augmenting it in some of these ways, what else have you seen done for virtual? Um, well, like with these kits, uh, uh, we talk about the multi-senses, uh, 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 a sense of taste and touch can be evoked. Right to use your physical and your uh, uh, audio cues to create a sense. You can ask yourself if we were serving food, what kind of food would it be, and sort of sort of bring that that feel to things as part of part of theming, part of harmonizing cues. Right now, what I, I've been focused on in my personal work because I teach is you know Zoom is our platform. Is just I'm doing a lot. What's nice about teaching, I can do a lot of experimentation on basically how to conduct that time differently. I mean, I have not only Zoom fatigue, I've got Zoom scheduling fatigue. I mean, <laughs> keeping, keeping track of all this stuff. And then and if, you yes. use like, if you use like uh, Teams or meeting, whatever Microsoft is called, the emails don't even tell you what time it is. It just gives you the link. Like it's like, so I got to look at a separate email to figure out when it's like, Ugh. so when, when, when people do participate, it's, it's like the 40 model of chapter two of the book. You've got it. I think it's not just educational, Again, it's the same thing when you're face to face. It needs to be entertaining to hold people's right. attention. It's inherently a sense of escape, right? Um, aesthetic. I, I've been fascinated with backgrounds. Like my, there, there is the like carefully crafted, like you know where you place, like uh, like I do. There's the of course the the bookshelf version, which is I think virtue signaling. I sometimes do that for my mm -hmm. office. There's the there's the I don't I don't care what it is, you know. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Forehead, uh, they're, uh, literally my, my students, some of the, they, they have, they're so used to being on laptops and streaming, they really don't care where it's at. There's the, the all white, right, which I also think is virtual signaling. I'm above all this. Um, so I think the you know, background is an opportunity to think about theming. I had students give a presentation on their own initiative. They, they, did, they had to design a, a hotel for the Dollar Tree. I make them as their design project, design a hotel for major brands. They all wore green, had green backgrounds, not green screen, like they did green. Uh, uh, so backgrounds, props. Yes. A little story. If, if you ask my kids who their favorite teacher was at the Ratner School, K through eight, sort of Montessori-based school, they all go, Mr. P. And I don't even know Mr. P's name. He's Mr. Oh. P even to parents. They say, <laughs> well, why, why do you like Mr. P? Oh, he's funny. See, he uses humor to, to, mm -hmm. to, to, to keep them attentive, right? Um, it's it, versus when my son went to high school and I had the first parent teacher conference with his algebra teacher within 60 seconds. I'm like, no wonder he's not learning. You're boring. <laughs> yeah. Right. So here's yeah. my latest character I brought to the classroom today. <laughs> and I had all the students as part entering the class. They like, you know, help me name them, you know, go into yeah. the, I got to work on my done out. I got, I was inspired by a student that came into class from the side like this. Right. Again, not every organization is going to take it. I'm not saying to be gimmicky. I have a reason for it. Um, uh, in fact, late, I, I bought these little finger puppets, rock, scissor, paper, because later I in the class, I used rock, scissor, paper as a, as a most simple loop. Right. One beats there mm -hmm. around the circle. There's an architectural theory of rock, scissors, paper. Um, so, again, it has to be tied to your content if, if you if you can. And I'm going to be talking about props later in the class. So. Yes, yeah, so those entertainment value. I think don't don't um, yeah. don't dismiss it. Uh, yeah. In fact, here's the big 
Biggest thing I miss about this medium is there's no collective laughter Be because one voice, the speaker dominates the audio. Mm -hmm. And I so, so miss it. And last week it hit me. And this is a, this, this, this is, this attests to the value of physical space. Last week it dawned on me because I was like, okay, any, any questions from the class? I get nothing. And mm -hmm. really, I lost the ability to use my bodily movement to move towards a person, to go oh, next to a person, right. to stand in the back room and face the way they are, to use where you place yourself in the space as a mechanism. And by the way, that's probably something, having learned that in this space, to take that in the physical space of a trade trade show. Yeah. Right? So there will be some lessons learned like, oh, we should be doing that, doing that all the time. I told you this when we talked earlier. I've had ideas for trade shows that like, I voiced in the umpteen years I've been at an exhibitor show. It doesn't happen. And now people will do is like, it took this. Yes. To realize, uh, things we should have been doing all along. Like I've always thought you got a booth, you got seven manufacturing plants. Why don't we have the ability to pipe in all plant managers? If a question comes up, we, 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 they don't have to all mm -hmm. be in the, in the, the booth. So that might happen. Just like in healthcare, it took this to realize there should be zero waiting rooms. Like, mm -hmm. Why, when people are sick, will we have them go in a commons area? It like makes we have the the mathematics to do appointment scheduling precisely enough and whisk people off to waiting rooms and design space to not put sick people with with other sick people. Other sick people, person. yeah. And hopefully, somebody is using this time to say, ah, you know, why don't we do that? Do that all the time. And that, that my boss is, people are going to lose their jobs. Some businesses are going to. Some people in this space are going to go out of business. But if you can work hard and use this time to survive and to innovate, there's going to be an opportunity to 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 create some great new experiences that that do blend appropriately. Yes, the mixture of both technology, both. Well, and on that, I've seen some of the virtual expos that have done a good job, like you said, of bringing in people that wouldn't or other, otherwise be in the booth that were able to right. either answer questions or, you know, give tours of the plant, you know, so they can actually see the facility behind the scenes or, you know, interact with, you know, somebody from R&D or something that would right. never be in the booth on the exactly. show floor. So. Exactly. exactly. That's, that's exactly right. Or here's like a case, Don, on me. Like I'm, I'm never going to have like joint office hours in the physical realm with a professor in the, in the theater department. Even though I talk about work as theater, right? But virtually, I can be like, hey, why don't we hang out? Why don't we have office hours in the same room together? And students could, could join in the a conversation that's never happened before. Oh yeah. But you know, getting people to break break their their rule. Uh, yes. I, I'm doing this for office hours. It's stole I stole it from Impractical Jokers, like one of the few shows I used to watch live. Um, besides Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul, uh, is that that uh, they ran out of episodes. So they started to have virtual dinner party together. Ah. So I had to have my first virtual dinner party office hours, maximum seven people, because eight's the ideal dinner party. And for an hour, we're going to bring our meal and show what we have. And, you know, I, I think, again, one of the best human experiences is, is to is to convene over food. Yes. Right? Yes. So dinners can be, can be thought differently in this medium for, you know, don't just go meet with the people you know before and sit at the same table with people you know before. We can now actually randomly put people at tables. And by the way, yes. we could change that by course. Yes. And there's some... a lot more cumbersome in the physical realm, but we have a multi-course meal. Okay. Scramble, scramble, scramble. And there are some some conferences and trade shows that have done some very Good. innovative virtual happy hours that I've seen. But again, it takes that whole thing. Like you said, they've got to think outside oh. of let's just take the physical and do this. It's like, no, no well, you have to innovate and re re-engineer. Ex excellent point. Marlis. Excellent point. The, when I was with CSC consulting, uh, which is the firm that invented re-engineering for those who have been around long enough to remember simultaneous rethinking of business process and technology, the argument before IT departments bastardized it and turned it into downsizing, the notion was to use the disruptive attributes of technology to design something new. And, and it was based on the notion that for, for decades, all the investment in technology had been used to automate current. You're exactly right. You can't just transfer your current practice. Mm -hmm. You have to look at the inherent properties of this medium and say, what can I do that I wasn't able to do before? And, and that's the, that's the thing to think. And then in the very process, simultaneously say, well, some of those practices, can I transfer to the physical realm 
to make the physical realm more attractive in the future. Yeah, greater mix of people involved, mm -hmm. you know, more, more random distribution of people. You know, you know, the best way to navigate, you know, a trade show or a conference, if you have multiple people from the same company, is, you know, you divide and conquer. You go to these sessions, you go to these sessions. Right. You know, their notes. If you're the sole representative from your company, you don't have that. Where's the upfront? Uh, we'll build your cohort. Where's the upfront diagnostic of what you're interested in? What are you shopping for? Okay. You know, you, you, again, we can use this medium to, to do that kind of thing. And maybe that kind of thing stay. And maybe you meet together in a, in a room before you go and compare notes. Cause you've answered some questions you've been teamed up. And so you're, you plan your joint thing when you go, it's those kinds of things that I hope emerge from this, that we end up actually enhancing the, the physical realm. If it's just this, goodness gracious, that that's like we all turn into Silicon Valley moles in our cubicles with no windows. I, I just can't live in that world. Right, right. <laughs> well, and Rama, you, Jim, you may not realize Rama is uh, from Lev Promotions, which is a promotional products company. And so she says producing the, the kits have been keeping her busy the last few months. Yeah, it's sure. been such fun finding ways to tie in what's in the box to the themes, messaging and goals of the event or meeting. And that is so I mean, because I know Why that's not? what you stress in your books. And what I've always stressed to all my exhibitor clients is yep. it's got to it's got to make sense. You can't just Throw yeah. something in a box and call but it think, good. Think about, I mean, think about kits, not just for home, but while you travel. You know, if, if people are driving, you send them one kit for stuff that's, you know, for in the car. Mm -hmm. uh, if they're flying, send them stuff that it's like uh, uh, Mike Vance, who founded Disney University for Walt Disney, has this thing called Kitchen of the Mind. He used to have all these. Uh, a, a little little container full of things that he would use to like decorate his seat in the airline suction cups on the window of a family picture and all this kind of stuff. And the flight oh. like would look at him like, "You're weird. Why would you do that?" And he'd go like, "Why are you not doing that?" Right. So you know, send send some things to you know to use on the plane if people are not just the safety things, but other you know mm -hmm. uh, 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 things as 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 well. And and you know, post event, you know, don't don't neglect the afterwards. Um. You know, leaving events, my friend Greg Bow at, at Merit's Travel, like, or Merit Global Events, I should say, talks about for many uh, conferences and trade shows, the, the, the final experience is your hotel bill. And if, oh. you, if you read anything about peak moments or Conahan's, like the final moment, it's a horrible way to send people. What are some, what are some farewell rituals that can be uh, introduced? And again, experiment in this medium, even in your meetings, but right? use your meetings to experiment as a laboratory for different kinds of group di group dynamics. Well, and Rama says it's what we call strategic memorability. Very good, very good. Yeah, I oh, love that. I saw the TM on there. Is it Rama? Is that, is that who? The Rama. Name Rama, use an EM for experience mark. <laughs> it's, it's not recognized by Congress. I've talked to lawyers about it, but there is of course, you know, TM for a physical good, SM for sales mark for services. Use EM, it's not protected. It would require legislation. I've often thought this is an industry that ought to co contact your, your mm. congressperson and lobby for the recognition of this officially of the EM mark. But uh, our tagline is, is EM. I've got a few people practicing it. That, that's, that's sidebar, uh, sidebar, sidebar. sidebar. <laughs> but that's very clever though, because it's true. I mean, an experience is, it, it's something that can be. Physical good. TM yeah. is associated with a physical good. Again, it's a holdover, right? So uh, she well, yeah. says they are in the process of getting it officially registered. That's your, that's your R. Yeah, but right. TM and SM and EM is not registered. So you, you might as well have an EM because it's just as protected as SM or TM until you get right. that R. Until you get the R. That's a good point. That's a good point. Well, on the subject of, of the difference between goods and services and experiences, one question I get from exhibitors a lot is how do I make it experiential when I'm selling a non-tangible something like a service? And so, you know, we always have, it always involves another whole level of brainstorming to come up with ways. And sometimes it's not that hard for me to see, but for them. So what, what advice do you give to somebody who is not selling something that's obviously experiential? Yeah, well, goods are tangible, services are intangible, experiences are memorable. So it's inherently difficult to demo a service, right? You, you, right. Have, to, you have to do a simulation or a role play. But but even with the good, recognize it's the using 
other good that is the experience. If I get my Yeti mug, it's the it's the drinking experience or the the keeping warm experience. The you so similarly, if you got a service, you can think about um, the the using of the service and think think about it this way: what you need to demonstrate. Time is the currency of experiences, right? Services are what you do. Time is the experiences are the time that your customers, your clients have with you. So you need to think about literally designing the time as a way to to demonstrate the nature of your services. So that that can be role play, simulations, analogies, um, mock ups. I, I've mm -hmm. often thought, why, why aren't there more scale models uh, in exhibits? Right, literally, just just scale small representations of it, instead of pictures of things dimensionally. By the way, this is a medium to do that kind of experimentation. And here's what here's how. Mo, I have a magician friend who's got two cameras, face on, and then from the top, so you can see his table magic. Uh huh. I've got a client that's that's installed multi camera. I've got someone with mobile camera, right? So the the multi camera angle at a scale model. Oh. Right, and maybe you build that scale model something you actually can. Because I've offered that. Why are we not in a physical space and looking at the scale model together again? Then you could depict the different steps along the the process of the service. Um, I've always thought we should have more miniaturization happening in trade show booths. Always thought that. Well, and of course now there's the virtual reality aspect too, where you can actually like go into yes. the model and and walk around kind of thing. I mean, yeah, I've always thought on the virtual reality on that that if, if you do it really well and you have to do it well, then people will be just satisfied just on it. I mean, it, it's 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 to like use it to point to the other is like I'm actually more fascinated with augmented reality. Yes, right? much more fascinated, and I've done augmented reality at, at case with just a a cadaver. I mean, it's, it's amazing. They can they can highlight. You can see just the nervous system, just the skeletal system, just the muscle system. It's a it, it's amazing. Yet you can still see everybody while you're doing it. So um, I'm much more fascinated with that. But, yeah, but the, you're, still, it, like you said, there, you're, you're still aware of the physical presence in augmented reality versus virtual. You're just, you're gone. You could be anywhere. Right. Well, that's true. And they have very different purposes. So again, it goes back to what are you trying to accomplish? Which one is going to be the better tool? But there's so much, there's so many resources and so many tools available that really, you know, people don't have excuses anymore. I mean, 20 years ago, when you wrote the book the first time, oh, yeah. it, you know, it just, there, there weren't all of the wonderful resources that people have now to actually bring these experiences to life well, in the way that we can. I, I do. I differ with my co-author a little, little bit. Joe Pine wrote a book called Infinite Possibility, his sort of technological view. I did not participate uh, because I'm I'm uh, I'm very critical of of big big data, big tech, and I wrote the preface to that book, and I basically challenged all organizations in that preface to ask themselves: Is 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 what you're doing um, promoting people to spend more time before a screen or less? Because I am definitely an advocate of spending less time on the screen, and that's a, that's just a value judgment. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's a point of view. But but as designers, I, I am I enjoy and spend most of my time trying to enhance the physical um, realm. Um, the digital realm is winning. Silicon Valley is winning. Um, but if you if you read books about the inner workings of Google, um, Facebook, I mean, quite frankly, I, I that mind that and that heavily engineered algorithm mindset here. Uh, here's a book I'll recommend, World Without Mind. You get to the last hmm. chapter and the author calls for a paper revolution. If you don't want to Google to see your information, use paper. <laughs> <laughs> kick, kick, it, kick it old school. Yeah. The more, well, people and do an email, the more people do an email, a physical thing, I tell my students, you know, you prepare a thought, thoughtful letter and an enclosure to an executive looking for a job. Nobody does that. You'll stand out. Well, and I know that this was several years ago, but when my husband, Alan, applied for a job, he actually, it, he interviewed and then he sent a physical thank you note and he got hired and it was on his boss's bulletin board. She said, this was such a rare thing to actually get a physical thank you note. It's your, it's your nostalgia point. In, so yes. you, you got, in authenticity, we talk about polarity. An age of in, things increasingly being automated and digitized, handwritten becomes authentic. Yes. You know, an email. Thank you very much. It was great to see you. Like, yeah, fine. It probably doesn't even get opened. Right. But a friend that says thank you. Okay, good. They said they said thank you. I don't got time for this. I got to move on. Handwritten note, a thoughtfully, I mean, it's just so, that's yeah. such a nice, nice touch to, 
to do you'd be surprised and those things those things add up those things yeah. add up. It really, and it's true. I think it's what it's going to take going forward for, for trade shows and for everything is a balance of, you know, we've learned now all of these potentials in the digital realm, but we need to figure out how to combine that with the physical realm going forward. I mean, we, we, you started this by asking about sales before I did a tangent on a tangent on a tangent as I'm one to do. Um, but recognize, I think when it comes to sales, recognize step one is be human. Yes. We, we might be getting past it, but early on, Nobody wanted to be sold to. There was no point, right? No one's buying. I mean, just reach out to your friends and empathize. Mm -hmm. and say, what do you think we ought to do? I mean, be helpful. I mean, I mean, again, Drucker, purpose of business is to create a customer. Spend time with your customers understanding needs and, and truly, I, mean, I actually think if you do marketing well, you don't have to sell as much. They're pre-sold, if you will. I also think right. if you have great experiences, you don't have to market. Um but now that that's been stripped away, those experiential opportunities, we do have to resort to marketing and 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 sales. By the way, I have a high regard for sales as a profession. I tell my students to get, get a sales job out of school because the number one thing you'll do is you'll come away a more confident person. Yeah. Because yeah. The, more, the more rejected, the better presenter you'll be. And these and these kids have lived a life of not being rejected. True. They're, they're good at everything. They got a trophy for every event. Yes. Like, You're a loser. <laughs> you lost. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, on the subject of connecting, Jim, how uh, other than your I know your website, Alan's going to put up is Strategic Horizons. Yeah. What what's the best way for people to reach out to you? LinkedIn, your website? Yeah, they're, they're, what? Uh, I have LinkedIn, but until recently, I accepted all invitations from LinkedIn indiscriminately unless they were from Nigeria and <laughs> uh, and, and did nothing more based on a marketing firm who printed on the back of their business card. I look forward to ignoring you on LinkedIn. I, I dabble <laughs> now, you know, uh, go, you know, send it to info at strategic horizons. It'll get forwarded uh, on to me. Um, if I could pitch a little bit of, you know, you can go to Amazon, not just to get the books, but for my lookbook, there's a video posted of me being interviewed about look, but also Jonathan Mann, who holds the world record for the most consecutive days of writing a song, right? Uh, he did a music video on look on my six looking glasses tool. So for ah. something fun, go to Amazon, click on Gilmore authors page and you'll see the, or the, I think the look book itself as a page, but it's a fun little catchy tune. You might find yourself humming uh, a, a bit. So that's a nice little, uh, by, by the way, that he's, I hired Jonathan to do gigs. Uh, he came to our final think about event, attended the whole thing. And then he wrote, a theme song to capture the entire 20 years of the event. It was like with a chorus, everybody could learn to sing. It was phenomenal. That is clever. That is very clever. Well, Jim, thank you so much for You're taking welcome. time out. I know you've had a busy day with classes all morning. So I thank you for taking time to join us here for virtual lunch. And uh, we all hope to see you next year at exhibitor live in Vegas. So. so One last thing. Yes. I'm an advocate. Wear the mask. Be considerate yes. of others. Wear the mask. Yes. That's how we're going to get our experience economy Absolutely. back. Absolutely. And it's for others. Yes. Yes. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thanks to everybody who joined us today for virtual lunch. We will see you back here next Tuesday. And until then, have a great week and keep us posted on what you're up to and what's going on in your exhibiting life. Bye. Thanks, everyone.